and these are in listen only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest IRS webinar. This is your host, Danielle Sumi, speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology Headquarters in Washington, D.C. The IRS, um, or IRS, is a consortium of universities and an NSF-funded science facility operating programs that enable Earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophysics, particularly in seismology. Today's webinar was solicited to highlight important technical results directly enabled through IRS. And webinars are recorded and archived on the IRS YouTube channel, so if you know someone who wasn't able to make it today, please point them to the IRS YouTube channel. The webinar ground rules are only the presenter, Dr. Robert Weekly, and I will speak. If you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the box on the webinar control panel. At the end, I will read your name and question to the speaker. If similar questions have been asked, I may combine or skip them. If the webinar crashes, which has happened twice, I will reboot it. Just click the link you received by email when registering. At the end of this webinar, I will send out a short five-minute survey via email. Your opinions and insight will help us to inform future webinars. One of the questions will ask if you're watching this remotely in groups. So if it's more than just you, please let me know. Today's webinar is part of IRS continued effort to provide resources and tools that enable research and professional development. Our presenter is Dr. Robert Weekly, who is a quality assurance and deployment engineer with IRIS Data Services in Seattle, Washington. Robert graduated with his PhD from the University of Washington in 2013, where he conducted research on tectonic and volcanic processes related to crustal accretion at Mid Ocean Ridge systems with passive and active geophysical techniques. With IRIS, Robert designs and tests data um, access services and maintains web services architecture developed by the IRIS Data Management Center. He also monitors automated systems responsible for data product generation and creates protocol for development of web services releases. So without further ado, here's Robert to talk about facilitating data discovery and access across the FDSN data centers with the IRIS Federator. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Danielle, for the opportunity to give the webinar today and to do a little bit of self-promotion here, uh, a bit to talk about the IRIS Federator. Uh, this is a newer system that the Data Services Group has developed here in Seattle, but really draws on a coordinated uh, international effort by the various seismic data centers across the globe to give and enable researchers access to the waveform and station metadata uh, that is held uh, by those very data centers. And we think that the Federator system is going to help serve as a, a good model uh, for tools that can help facilitate that widespread data discovery and access. <coughs> Uh, so just to provide a quick outline of uh, what I'm going to be covering today, I'm going to try and keep this uh, quick and tidy and leave uh, lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, but first, I'll talk a little bit about the International Federation of Digital Seismograph Networks, or the FDSN, and how they were uh, instrumental in promoting a set of standardized web services for accessing waveforms and metadata across different data centers. Then we'll get into some specifics of the different components that make up the Federator system and then wade into the nitty gritty of some usage examples of actually uh, using the Federator and how it, help, and how it might help the uh, researcher, educator, technician, data hound, citizen scientist, all of the above, uh, help these users uh, find the data that you need regardless of where it might be physically stored. Uh, so, uh, just as some quick background, starting in uh, 2013, the FDSN approved a set of specifications for web services that standardized access to data across any data center that served uh, time series or station metadata or hypocenter information. And in order to access that data, you very likely had to go through one or many of these services listed here on the, on the slides, the uh, station, data select, or event services. And so that specification that was set up by the FDSN, uh, that provides data centers with a clear, unifying set of rules and standards for how to receive data requests and ultimately transmit that data to the end user. 
uh, these services have been widely adopted now to the point where it's not just Iris, but um, indeed more than a dozen other data centers across the globe have adopted one or all of these services, and we hope for um, even more widespread distribution in the future. <clears throat> um, so the Federator uh, leverages these two services, specifically the uh, station and data select services, to provide a tool for really easy access and discovery of waveforms stored, uh, again, not just by IRS, but by any of the FDSN data centers. Um, so in order to rely on the power provided by that underlying standard, there are a few relatively uh, unobtrusive, hopefully unobtrusive uh, requirements that a data center has to meet in order for its holdings to be included within the federator. Uh, first things first, they have to have working and uh, uh, stable, publicly available versions of both the station and data select services. Uh, the whole thing just doesn't really work without having those two first and foremost, so got to have it. Uh, but the other two required parts here are that there needs to be some flow of unrestricted time series data coming out of the center and that the station service specifically must support the FDSN approved text format. Um, what that means uh, for the operators out there is that when a user is crafting a URL for their request, uh, your service has to be able to support the format equals text option. Uh, some other things that are considered um, kind of optional, not necessarily explicit requirements, but just things that help the federator determine uh, data availability um, are that the station service should support either the uh, match time series and or the include availability parameters. Um, so part of the mutual benefit here is that we get, as we get a few more years of exposure and expand the number of data centers that are hosting these web services, um, we start to really increase the footprint of accessible data and the power and utility of the Federator just grows right along with that. Um, so currently the number of Federated data centers is uh, 15 with each center being represented here on this slide. That includes uh, three centers in North America, uh, near about a dozen um, distributed across Europe, and then one in South America in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, if you'd like a complete list of any of the data centers that employ any of the station data select or event services, uh, you can go to this address here uh, direct at the bottom of the screen uh, directly through the FDSN website. Okay, I think I've talked enough now about the background and proliferation of web services, so let's get into the guts a little bit of what this federated system is, how it works, and how you can get the data you need for your research. Um, so there's these two big components to the federator, which is the harvester routine. Uh, this basically finds out what data is being held where and builds a catalog of what we call data center holdings. And then there's the uh, web service part, which acts as the front door for actually fielding user requests, searching through the harvester's catalog, and um, then ultimately sending out the data to the, uh, to the user that requested it. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, in detail about the harvester first. Um, so this routine, uh, once per day, goes out and automatically queries all of the different station services out there to find uh, metadata being hosted at different data centers. And this helps to create a, a, compiles all this data and organizes it into a working daily snapshot of the most currently available uh, metadata at each center. And we use that as kind of a proxy for uh, the actual time series data that's available, but that might not be 100% true in all cases. Um, so that metadata uh, down to the channel level is compiled into this database of channel holdings and uh, some of the metadata associated with these holdings you can see here um, on the screen in this little purple box over to the side and that includes uh, the unique channel identifier, some sensor location information and orientation and also some of the uh, instrument response information. Um, <clears throat> so as far as the availability of individual centers goes, uh, there can be times when we have a situation where the harvester goes through its daily run, but a data center might be down, or perhaps the services are temporarily unavailable for whatever reason. So the harvester, instead of reporting at no data 
no data available kind of situation um, and having an incomplete catalog for that 24-hour cycle um, can instead revert back to the previous day state of a complete holding for that data center. And so it will just continue processing requests as that center services are restored. Uh, but this prevents a situation where one data center being down means that you can't request you can't complete your request for data across other centers. Um, so just to give everyone an idea of the scale of the uh, volumes of available data that we're talking about here, um, I have this little graph that shows uh, the number of channels uh, for each data center. Uh, please note the logarithmic x-axis here. Um, this data is current as of uh, last Wednesday and shows the three North American data centers uh, by far hold the largest number of channels, uh, followed by Geophone and Recife and on through the other European data centers and with the Sao Paulo Center uh, sharing their network, which is comprised of about a dozen channels. Uh, but the main point here is not necessarily the number, but rather to show that there is a wide distribution of centers represented and we're always eager for more centers to be able to contribute. The more centers we have contributing, the higher their visibility, the better growth for the federator, and the more direct access to data the users and researchers get. That's all makes things better on everybody's side. So that's all happening kind of behind the scenes, uh, but the user experience with the federator is really driven by the Fed Catalog uh, web service that we've developed. This service provides a tool for searching through the Harvester catalog, and the real power here is being able to leverage uh, client-side federation for the request being made. And what that means, uh, basically, is that the software is able to do the hard part of organizing and then subsequently crafting and ultimately distributing individual requests to each data center uh, without any direction or input, really, from the person actually making the request. Um, <clears throat> It's important to uh, point out here that in this model of data aggregation and organization, the users are going directly to the service backends for each of these data centers and uh, directly pulling mini seed data and station XML metadata from those services. So none of the actual request or shipping process of data flows through the IRIS DMC here. Um, with this slide, um, I should point out a couple, well, I have to point out one thing, namely uh, the URL, the actual Fed Catalog service homepage here up at the top of the slide. Uh, you can go there for all of the detailed info you need to really use the service uh, for your own purposes. Uh, it's got service documentation, our familiar URL builders, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, but all the information is there at that website. Um, the second thing for this slide is uh, this little cartoon that hopefully gives you some visual representation of what client-side federation is really about. Um, so here, in, instead of the user uh, having to search through metadata at several individual sites and then crafting separate requests for separate data centers, um, the user can instead really simply query the Fed Catalog service for certain channels, and then the Federator software clients can go out and fetch all that data from each data center uh, based on the most current holdings uh, catalog that they have. Um, so some more details about the web service, um, the Fed Catalog web service. Basically, if you're familiar with making requests using the station data select services, this is more or less the same deal. Uh, specify some network, station, channel identifiers, maybe start in end times, maybe sort it by geography, throw in some wildcard expressions. You can even send your requests via get or post style. It's all basically same, same, same. So if you're familiar with how to use the station data select services, you'll know how to use the Fed Catalog service too. Um, now with that being said, there is one important distinction unique to the Fed Catalog service here, uh, which is the ability to identify and remove duplicate data channels from the search results. Um, by default, the service will not include those redundant channel holdings, uh, but we do give the option to return all channels matching the request regardless of the, data, of the source data center. <clears throat> Um, so I mentioned the URL builders a little bit before. Uh, the, this is kind of a uh, just an image of the one that we have for the Fed Catalog service. Uh, the location of this, the URL for it, is up at the top of the slide if you want to go there directly and start playing around with it yourself. Uh, but these are really helpful 
to help acquaint new users to Iris Web Services, or if you're just not generally familiar with how to get your data through Iris, uh, we've developed these really approachable URL builders um, in order to help out. So this slide shows some of the highlights of that. Um, this is just a screenshot, but again, if you go to the address up here at the top of the slide, you can uh, interact with it yourself and put in your own search parameters. Um, <clears throat> but basically, you're, as I mentioned before, you can set network station channel, um, add some time or geographic boundaries. Uh, we have this really handy dandy point and click map utility uh, to be able to help uh, physically draw out regions of interest that you might have. And as I mentioned before, um, we can include overlapping data segments available at any center, uh, or you can just have uh, results returned that are, um, that are unique channel holdings. So as you go through and enter information into each of these fields, uh, it automatically populates this URL down here at the bottom and uh, will dynamically change uh, based on whatever you enter above. So once you have your parameters set, click on the link and it will execute your request. Um, this is mostly meant, again, for very general illustrative purposes, and once you become a little more familiar with the service, uh, you can easily start scripting your own uh, bulk requests or start developing uh, your own clients even that use the information uh, exposed by the service. Um, so at this point, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about those overlapping data segments and how we deal with those. And those are mostly enforced by the uh, business rules that we have that the federator uses and can provide some control on how data federation occurs across data centers. Um, these rules only come into play now when multiple data centers are involved and have the same data and there is overlap in the channel holdings. Um, I should note here that all of these rules are developed uh, very much in collaboration with the other data centers, and these are not being set uh, unilaterally by IRIS. Um, <clears throat> so this table shows an example of just a few of the rules that we currently have in place. And the way this works, uh, basically the higher the ranking number over here on the right-hand side of the table, uh, the greater the priority for the network. Um, so each rule uh, listed here affects a certain network, but the level of detail can really extend down to the channel and location identifiers too. Um, we don't currently have many federation rules that are time dependent, but we anticipate a greater need for that in the future, and so we're prepared to support that kind of granularity uh, should it be requested by that data center. Taken together, uh, these rules yield a weighting system, basically, that gives, the that gives the centers clear priorities for serving the data that they themselves host. So for in this example, uh, we have a couple rules that call out priority networks for centers, IU for IRIS, uh, BK for the uh, NCEDC, RECIF, uh, INGV, and Geophone all have their priority networks too. And indeed, we have rules, uh, sometimes multiple rules, for each of the 15 federated data centers that I mentioned before. Um, these, uh, all these rules help resolve uh, issues of data overlap and are used by the service by invoking the include overlap parameter in your requests. So at this point, um, I think I'd like to move on to some of the use cases and examples for uh, how the service works and how some of your favorite IRIS software clients uh, have been changed to uh, enable use of the Federator and can facilitate your data requests. Um, <clears throat> so alongside development of the Fed Catalog service, we've also updated uh, several pieces of software to use the Federator 2. Um, a list of clients can be, uh, can be seen by going to the URL up near the top. That's service.iris.edu slash clients. Uh, there you can find things like the always popular fetch data command line script, uh, the iris fetch.m MATLAB friendly client, and these can both easily accommodate federated data requests by simply enabling some extra option flags, uh, which we'll see more of in just a minute. Um, but we expect to extend federated support to our other clients uh, very soon. Uh, we're 
development for OBSPY is currently underway for those of you who use uh, the OBSPY tools. And uh, we hope to have Federator support for Wilbur and uh, for the Iris tools, uh, Wilbur and JWeed, or its uh, Pythonic replacement PyWeed uh, in the very near future. So uh, let's take a quick look at what a Federator request really looks like and what kind of data is returned by the service. Um, so on this slide, there's a very there's a sample URL up at the top. This is the actual command that you enter into your web browser and send to the Fedalog, Fed Catalog service. And you can all run this command directly in your own browser to see the results for yourselves. Um, in this case, we are uh, looking for any LHZ channel data that is available globally during a, a six-hour period in June of 1997. So this is really just a snippet of a few lines of data from what was returned. Uh, the full response includes a complete list of all the available, ch all the available channels uh, from each data center. Um, it's not actually cut off like is represented here on the slide. Uh, but what you should notice right off the bat here is that when you're actually making requests from the cat Fed Catalog service, you don't actually get waveform data back directly, but you get a text list of all the available channels. Um, these lists are organized by data center and have been formatted in such a way that they can be, then be sent right back out the door and submitted directly to the data center service endpoints to then actually go and retrieve the mini seed data or station XML metadata, whatever it is that uh, you seek. Now, um, the changes that we made to our clients like Fetch Data have removed this intermediate step. And again, as we'll see in just a minute, um, the clients, they will actually go and download mini seed data to your desktop. Um, but we've decided to expose this level of information uh, within the service in order to give people in the community the opportunity to use this format to develop their own clients for data retrieval if they so wish. Uh, so let's see. This particular request ends up returning something like 370 different channels of data um, across uh, five different data centers. But if we were to just simply change the time limits on this request and look for more recent data, uh, that number uh, expands up to nearly 2,700 channels uh, distributed across nearly a dozen different data centers. Um, so lots of good opportunities for getting data from very uh, dis disparate sources here. Um, so at this point, I'm going to exit out of the PowerPoint here to show off some concrete examples of using the Fetch Data Script uh, to go get some mini seed data from around the world. Uh, so if you'll just bear with me real quick while we get that set up. Hopefully I can uh, make this legible for everybody. And I have some pre-cooked little examples here uh, just for some ease of use. Uh, the first example I'm going to take is for looking at data from, uh, the, uh, from the recent Ferndale earthquake uh, that was in December of 2016, magnitude 6.5, just off the coast of California. Um, so with this request, we're really looking for um, channel data that's uh, distributed across most of the North American networks primarily. Um, but the illustrative example here should look really familiar to anybody who's um, ever used the Fetch Data client before. Uh, all of the inputs are basically the same. You set your time boundaries, set a geographic search area, and we're looking for BHZ data here. We can set the output for the mini seed and the metadata. And then in order to get the federated part of this, it's really just as simple as adding a dash capital F here at the end of the request. Um, <clears throat> setting that capital F will then go out and instruct the fetch data script to go federate requests across multiple data centers. And just to illustrate that here, um, I'm not going to go through with the entire request downloading. It takes a little bit of time, but just to illustrate um, What's happening here, uh, the Fetch data script has gone out to, uh, indeed, the three North American centers, IRIS, NCEDC, and SCEDC, to find related metadata and time series data for this event. Um, I'm just going to quickly cancel out of this as it downloads the data. But you can see here that I ran this um, 
I ran this example before just to make sure we we're able to download all the data. Um, but basically, all the results are now organized by the data center from which it came from. So sure enough, we can take a quick look at this mini seed data and see that we have a couple dozen BHZ channels from the BK network that um, can be used to then look at the earthquake and uh, do the necessary analysis for. And again, the, um, that's organized by metadata and by the, and by data center as well. Um, so if we have time for just another quick um, demonstration here. Um, with the uh, recent eruption around Mount Etna, maybe there's some uh, excitement about going to find data at some of those uh, European data centers and uh, looking at some volcanic earthquakes, something that's kind of close to my research heart as well. Um, <laughs> but again, we're going to instruct the, the fetch data command to go federate things with this capital F option. Uh, it's fairly similar to the uh, command I just ran, but going over a much uh, broader area and sure enough now we see uh, many different data centers that are contributing data to this request um, throughout Germany and parts of Europe. Uh, INGV is obviously very well represented here and um, again I'm just going to quit out of this command otherwise it would take several uh, maybe ten, five or ten minutes in order to go run um, but you can see that again all of the related time series and metadata is here nice and neatly organized by data center so that you can go and either find you can either aggregate all of that data together uh, for your own purposes or treat it separately um, so that's about all I have uh, for everyone today again uh, Danielle, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, one of the, our uh, newer services by the Data Services Group here. Uh, we think that as the number of data centers expands and uh, has a little bit, it can fill in some of the global gaps of uh, the data centers, this is going to be a really powerful tool uh, for enabling researchers to go out and directly uh, download the time series data that they need for the research. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Um, this gives us a good amount of time for questions about your own requests and things that you need. So if you have any questions, please write it into the question box. Um, Ellen, you wrote, um, so would a request crafted by the Federator look different than a request done directly to the data center? Um, and so could you um, distinguish, maybe recap, um, like how you would manage those requests? Um, request made to the data center itself, yes, I guess exactly. is the question. Could... The federator, yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, um, the client, the fetch data clients and the MATLAB stuff take care of all that on its own. Um, if you're interested, though, in organizing the data by yourself or uh, through your own tools, um, <clears throat> we try and format the output from the Fed Catalog Service to make that as easy as possible. So I'm just going to go back to the slide here where we had the example coming from the service itself. And so again, this is organized by data center. Uh, you have the station and data select service backends explicitly written out in the format. And then each line here represents a unique channel identifier and timepiece that should be really easily formatted to put like into a post request and then submitted to either the station or data select services. Um, so it requires a little bit of uh, parsing through the text output if you want to then uh, just use the service and then go out and make the request yourself. Um, but we hope that this is really clearly organized and makes it kind of as painless as possible. Okay, great. Um, that's the only question that we really had. Um, do you, oh, wait. Okay, one's coming in. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> enough. That's fine. David Mason asks, um, for production mode as opposed to research mode use, is it possible to set up continuous feeds of real-time waveform data? 
we do not in have real time uh, enabled for the Federator at this point. Uh, that still all goes through our Seedlink servers and is kind of a different separate system than uh, what we're presenting here. Uh, you'll notice I tried to have it. I tried to have as as recent an example there as possible, but uh, real time is not necessarily something that uh, this system is set up for. Is that something that is for looking that you would try to have done in the future, or no? Is that like not going to be? I think at this point the priorities are to update our current clients, um, uh, Obspy, um, uh, Wilbur, and Jweed, in order to um, in order to use federated data access. Uh, we'll look into expanding that to the seed link real time aspect of things. I think uh, once those once those other priorities are met. Okay. Um, there's never another question coming in from David Mason about the metadata, um, about asking, are metadata available in dataless seed format? Is that still the case? Um, most of our clients just get it through, get, um, re receive the station XML metadata. Okay. Um, Aaron Sweeney asks, um, he says this is a two-parter around monitoring use of the Fed catalog service and of data access from a data center. Um, the first part, part A, um, does the capability exist within IRIS to report which um, data centers are receiving requests via Fed catalog and from whom and do the DCC, do the DCs, sorry, see the request um, as coming from Fed catalog or from the IP of the client? Okay, so let me see if I got the first part of that right. right. Um, <laughs> so that's the just first, the first part. <laughs> can, we, yeah. can, we, can, we, can you repeat that first part of again course. there, please? Um, does the capability exist within IRIS to report which data centers are receiving requests via the Fed catalog and from whom? Why don't we start there? Yeah, those kind of sound like the similar questions. Um, as I tried to make clear, the none of these requests are coming from the catalog themselves. I, I believe it's true that um, the individual request is going directly to that data center back end from the user making the request. So there's no routing of any kind or no logging being made on our end except to note that the federator and the fed catalog service is being used. Um, the actual statistics for data shipments though, um, that should be recorded and um, that should be recorded by the data center that actually hosts the data. That, that was kind of a big point of why the system came about in the first place, um, <clears throat> was to uh, increase the visibility of these other data centers and to um, enable them to more easily and more directly serve the actual data that they host instead of having uh, the IRIS data services group act as an intermediary there. So okay. I hope that kind of puts it. Yeah. I hope that kind of yeah. The question. And so, do other data centers? Do they also report? Like, if you're querying just the data centers, do they also report back to IRS on like size and volume, so you can get a, like a a better estimate of like what the reach is? Is that is there collaboration between data centers so you can get those type of numbers? Um, not explicitly. I think basically the harvester routine, which I kind of talked about, is, is, is really solely responsible for finding out the data that's available. Um, we have some specific parameters for the station service that can provide some more details about what data is specifically available, but um, not necessarily that those parameters aren't necessarily supported by every single data center. So the ways that we report um, available data and most current up-to-date metadata might vary a little bit from one data center to the next. Okay, it's good to know. But I, there, there's no explicit um, handshake going on to um, between the data centers. It's mostly just querying that station service that's available. Okay, great. Um, Rob Port asks if there are plans for more data centers to provide like SAC pulls and zeros files or response um, file web services. Um, yeah, we're kind of working on that at this point. Uh, to get a little into the weeds on that, um, it actually requires uh, some updates 
to our um, to our Java library in order to allow for each of the individual data centers to uh, host and then uh, transmit data for their own like SAC PZ or response based uh, service. Right now, this is pretty much restricted only to the FDSN um, <clears throat> the FDSN approved web services, station, data select, and event. Although event isn't really used in the Federator, so um, but really it's just station and data select for now. And whatever response information is gathered comes from the Iris SAC PZ service. Uh, we're working to change that. I know that Berkeley has their own. Uh, SAC PZ service as well that they'd like um, for us to use, uh, but that's going to require a couple change, a couple more changes to some of our underlying uh, systems to make that possible. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so um, there are currently no additional questions. If anybody has anything, like I guess speak now or ever hold your peace. Um, uh, Rob, do you have any? Oh, wait. Okay, one more. <laughs> okay, sure. um, Aaron Sweeney asks. Um, you mentioned event services at the beginning, um, and how does it fit in with the federal cat federated catalog? It sounds like it doesn't right now. It, like it does, that event services is something separate, or no? Is that not the case? No, the event service is not really being used as part of the federator. Um, we're going to have to figure out how it kind of plays nice with uh, with the Wilbur client that uses okay. a lot of very um, event based information. Um, but we're 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 working in development for that. Um, but there's never going to be a real um, there's never going to be a federated event service. It's this is mostly for time series and uh, station metadata. We might be able to use an event service in order to kind of window out certain requests, but we're not going to be distributing hypocenter information or Quake ML uh, between different data centers. There's no plan for that. Okay. Um, so David Mason asks again, when, if or when continuous waveform feeds become available, like through Seedlink service, um, would it then be dependent upon each data center, center providing their own server? Likely, yes. That it, yeah. We we get into some pretty complicated issues there, qu pretty quickly, um, that are going to rely on systems that lie well outside of um, Iris's scope. Um, you know, even with the, even with the stored data, there can be times where a data center might not be uh, fully functional, or the services are down for whatever temporary reason, and we have no, we at Iris have no control over that. Um, we attempt to. Um, process the the requests as as uh, as completely as possible, but again, this is reliant on systems that are beyond the scope of our control. So those problems only start getting magnified when we start talking about latency and seed link and earthworm and all these other things. Um, okay. we'll, we'll we'll just have to cross that bridge, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right, one thing at a time. Um, okay, so that seems to complete our series of questions. Um, so Robert, if Wonderful. there's, if there's like, do you have like a, maybe a summary sentence that you'd like to say, or if people have questions in the future, um, is there, you know, are you, you, I guess the best person to contact, or how do we get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, that would be just fine here. Um, I have my email address down here on the bottom right hand side of the slide. Um, if you have someone else in the services group that you'd rather talk to, that's fine too. I won't take any offense. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we really hope that uh, you know the Federator is still kind of in its uh, relative infancy compared to some of our other uh, services. and. Uh, we're really eager to see more data centers start adopting these FDSN approved services to allow us to grow the utility of the Federator uh, right along with that um, widespread adoption. So hopefully uh, we can only get bigger and better in the future here. Great. Um, Judy Thomas asks if the slides can be made available. Would you mind putting them as a PDF and I can put it on the um, webinar website of IRIS? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll talk to you, Danielle, about uh, how to set all that up. Okay, perfect. So you guys can look out for the slides as well as the um, YouTube video. And we also put it on our main website at iris.edu slash HQ for headquarters slash webinar. So you can find out about all upcoming webinars. Um, and um, 
I mean, everything else that we can find. And then there's one like last minute question. Sorry, Rob. Right. No, that's <laughs> um, fine. But Dan Auerbach asks if there's any point for additional data centers offering data that already exists at IRS. Um, is there any? So the question is. Yeah, is if it, the data is if the data is already at IRIS, what is the benefit to the other data center to host their own data? Pretty that's kind of how I that's kind of how I interpret it. That's how I interpret um, it too. So let's go with that. Okay, great. Um, I think that the real benefit here it depends on their uh, their level of engagement and how visible they want to be. Um, a lot of this is getting more hits to other data centers and to serve their users more directly. Um, <clears throat> if you have uh, local users in Turkey, let's say, then KOERI database or data center can then, uh, you know, people can actually go directly to that data center instead of having to uh, traverse the long uh, big fat tubes of the internet to come all the way here to Seattle and then go back to their, uh, to their home region. So the, there, there's some potential, I think, to help uh, the performance of different requests there, and it helps raise the, vil the visibility of the data centers that actually host the data there. So um, if they get more hits for logging, um, I, I can't see that as being anything but good for them. Great. All right. Well, with that... Um, I appreciate um, the time that we spent today and uh, the time that you've answered a lot of people's questions as well. It was a hard Q&A session. Um, Absolutely. And if there's any others, feel free to email me and uh, reach out directly. I'm happy to answer more. Great. Well, thank you so much. And that concludes our um, IRIS webinar for this week. Stay tuned. We have um, our next one is coming up on the Salton Sea Imaging Project um, on March 15th. So, um, yeah, and if you haven't already, please uh, register with the um, IRIS uh, Messaging Center under the webinars. One, oh, yes, um, please. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, needs, this needs more visibility as well. Yeah, that's right. And so um, if you have any um, requests about which ones you're subscribed to, please check with the IRIS um, Message Center for everything that you're currently subscribed to. So, all right. Well, with that, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. All right. Take care. Thank everybody. you very much, Neil. All right. Bye. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Bye.